and we lift you up, Heavenly Father. We glorify you. We lift you up, God. We lift you up, God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We worship you. We worship you, God. We bow down to you. We bow down, oh God Almighty. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. You said if my people that are called by my name, God, could humble themselves, Jesus, and turn from our wicked ways, then we will hear from you. God, we need to hear from you. If there's a time we don't need is now, is now. Now is the time, oh God. Now is the time, God. With all that is going on, God, we need you. We need you, Jesus. We need your presence back into our country. We need your presence back into this world. We need your presence back into our schools. We need your presence back into our houses. We need your presence oh god almighty jesus so god i ask right now that you humble your children this morning humble them oh god give them a humble heart give them a heart like yours this morning god give them a heart to know no way but your way this morning give them a heart oh god to move from the wicked ways and seek your face. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless your holy name, Jesus. Bless your holy name, God. Jesus, when we look around us, when we look at the TV and we see all these children, all these people, oh God, are crying out for you. All these people, oh God, they don't have a roof over their head. These people are walking day by day by day. God, they are thirsty. But Father God, we call upon you in the name of Jesus right now because you are a holy God. You're not a God that forget us this morning. You're not a God that forget us this morning. You say if we draw close to you, you draw close to us. So Father God, we come close to you this morning. We lift up your holy name. We cry in the name of Jesus because there is deliverance in the name. There is healing in the name. Jesus, there is peace in the name. We need peace this morning. We need peace this morning. The peace that passes all understanding this morning. Not the peace that the world has for us this morning. But your peace this morning, oh God. So grant us that peace right now. Let your peace flow through our hearts. Let your peace take over our mind this morning, God Almighty. As you speak to your children. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We want to get right into the word of God this morning. Uh, if you joined us, you saw that the, the topic that we're going to talk about is the sovereignty of God. Pastor Roger uh, led us uh, last week on that topic, and I am blessed to be able to continue that topic with you this morning. And so we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God. And if time permits, we're also going to talk about the providence of God, the divine providence of God. And so uh, at this time, I'm going to ask you to turn with me or, or go into your app to your Bible and go to Genesis 1 and verse 26. That's Genesis 1 and verse 26. And the Bible says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And I'm going to explain why I chose this scripture in a few minutes, but first I want to get into the definition of sovereignty. 
And so sovereignty is defined as supreme power or authority. It is the authority of a state to govern itself or another state. And so what does that mean when we're talking about God? Because we also saw in that scripture, God gave us dominion. And if you look up the, the, the definition of dominion, dominion is also sovereignty. So are we sharing sovereignty with God or is there some other definition that is in that we define that God may see differently? And so when we look at scripture and when we look at our definition, what I, I'm gonna use a big word, extrapolate, is that God sees sovereignty on another level. He sees himself as being supreme even to our dominion over the earth because what he gives us the authority. And so, and then the second part of that, that verse, uh, excuse me, definition that I really liked where it says the authority of a state to govern itself. God governs himself. He doesn't need help. He doesn't need anybody to come in and tell him what to do. Even when we pray, even when we pray to God and we ask God, we're asking. That does not mean that God is that God is uh, seeking our wisdom or our counsel. He counsels Himself, and I'll share that scripture with you later. And so I want to get uh, share with you very quickly the definition of providence because it they're tied together. Providence is the exercise of that authority. It is a manifestation of divine care or direction. I like this definition. They say it's prudent management of resources. And where do we see this in scripture? Because nowhere in scripture does it really talk about sovereignty and providence. So where do we get, where, where do we realize that that is what God is talking about? I'll show you. It's in Ephesians 1 and 11, and I'm reading the King James Version to you. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things that are after the counsel of his own will. So there you see, there's a lot of different things that we talk about come down, combined in that one scripture, right? It talks about how, how everything that we have is predestinated. It comes from him. And that he, what, counsels his own will, right? He counsels himself. So you see all of that in Ephesians 1 verse 11. Sovereignty is the absolute ability or authority of God. And providence is the manifestation of that authority in our lives. Another definition of providence is God's omnisciently directing the universe and the affairs of humankind with wise benevolence. So what? He's not just directing our lives. He's directing everything. He's directing the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars. And we saw that when God created the earth in the beginning. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. The scripture that I want to bring you to is Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 11. And what does the Bible say? He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and return it not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which what I please because I'm sovereign and it shall prosper the thing whereto I sent it. So God is showing us his sovereignty and he's showing us his sovereignty in three parts. First, I want to talk about his name, God's name. One of his names that we know him by, the first name is Elohim, which means supreme one or mighty one. And as I was doing my research, the Jewish uh, defines that word in its saying that it's in its plural form. Plural, we know, means more than one. And so, so what are we talking about? Because we know that God is the only wise God. So how is it in a plural form, talking about him being the supreme one. So let's look at scripture. We see God define himself 
in his sovereignty as the father. Revelations 4 verse 11 says, you are worthy our Lord and God to receive glory and an honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. God the Father. We see the sovereignty of God represented as the Son. Matthew 28 and 18, it says, and Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. So we see that the sovereignty of God rests in his son, Jesus Christ. We also see that sovereignty represented in the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, verse 1 through 4. And it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit was exercising what? His sovereignty in how he moved and whom he chose to touch. I want to talk a little bit uh, about the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit because Scripture teaches us and we tend to focus on the Holy Spirit being here to comfort us. The Holy Spirit is here to guide us. The Holy Spirit loves on us. The Holy Spirit is there to watch over us. And that's what we tend to focus on. But the Holy Spirit operates in sovereignty with God and Jesus. The same reverence that we have for God, the same reverence that we have for, the, for Jesus and the name of Jesus Christ is the same reverence that we should have for the Holy Spirit. And we don't see that. I, I, know, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention, but we don't see that in the church. We don't see that in the world because you can't, you say Jesus Christ too much, somebody gonna look at you and be like, but if somebody speak and fake tongues, we laugh, we think it's a joke, right? We don't put that same reverence on the Holy Spirit. And when we look through scripture, we see the people of God having this misunderstanding about the awesome presence of God, about the Holy Spirit, and the authority in which the presence of the Lord operates. If you go through scripture, both Old and New Testament, you will see folks being taken out because they do not reverence the Holy Spirit. And so we have to change our thinking we have to shift our mindset and see the Holy Spirit operating in the same level of sovereignty as the Father and the Son. Just, okay, I want to say this. Just because the Holy Spirit operates from a position of servanthood, because we see the Holy Spirit sent to serve us, right? Because what did Jesus say? Uh, I'm leaving, but I'm sending you a comforter. And so we take that, and I, I believe that we internalize that as the Holy Spirit being sent to serve. But even though he serves, he is still sovereign. He still operates in that sovereignty. And that is what we must understand. Why? Because when we lack this understanding as believers, it puts us as a great disadvantage from seeing God move in our lives. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that does the moving. Yes, Holy Spirit, I feel your presence. I'm acknowledging you this morning. So let me show you in scripture what I'm talking about, about the Holy Spirit doing the moving. Genesis 1, verse 1 through 3. I told y'all we would get back to Genesis. 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then what happens? And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Three, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so we see the authority of God being operated in three parts, right? First, God creates. Two, the spirit of God moved. And three, the word of God, Jesus, being spoken and was released. And so we see that the spirit of God, the, the Holy Spirit operates in sovereignty, in tandem, in alignment with God the Father and God the Son. 
we see chaos, disarray, dysfunction became order when the spirit of God moved. Disorder shifts into order in our lives when the spirit of God moves. Chaos operating in our world has to shift into order when the spirit of God moves. If we don't understand the spirit of God is sovereign, then we will miss the moves of the Holy Spirit. We will downplay the moves of the Holy Spirit or completely dismiss the moves of the Holy Spirit and take the Holy Spirit for granted. How many times have you felt the presence of God? I'm not talking about in church. I'm talking about in your daily lives. You're, and I'm not, I don't mean because you're praising God or you're, you're focusing on him. I'm talking about you're watching TV and the spirit of the Lord moves and you dismiss it. I'm talking about when you're in the grocery store and the spirit of the Lord moves and you dismiss it. I'm talking about when you're having a conversation and the spirit of the Lord moves and you dismiss it. You are dismissing an opportunity to see God move in your life and in someone else's life. Why? Because it's the sovereignty of God interrupting your day. And so when we do not have that reverence for the Holy Spirit, we are missing out on what God is trying to do. Talk to somebody that is that connected to the Holy Spirit and moves when he says to move. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. People are being saved. Lives are being transformed. Why? Because they are operating and being led by the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going on to, um, I told y'all I was telling, I was going to talk to you about uh, Genesis. And so I'm going to do that now. God uses the story of creation in Genesis to teach us about his sovereignty and about his original plan for our lives. That was a purpose, one of the purposes of Genesis. And this plan was for us to have dominion over the earth instead of being subjected to it. Now, while doing my research, I came across this great summary of the beginning of Genesis that I like, and I'll share with you now. I'm saying all of that because it doesn't come from me. It says, the book of Genesis is a cemetery for lifeless myths and dead gods. The book of Genesis was written by Moses when the people of God were coming out of Egypt and preparing to enter the promised land. Now, now catch this, because this is important. The people of God, however, were still wrapped up in the false idols of Egypt. Egyptians at that time worshiped the sun, they worshiped the moon, they were worshiping dogs, they were worshiping cats, you name it. We, and we know this, Egyptians weren't the only ones. There are a lot of different cultures that had monotheistic gods. And so inspired by God, Moses wrote Genesis to teach the people of God first about who God is and his sovereignty. Its purpose was to liberate God's people from false idols and have their hearts turn to the true and living God. God never wants us to be in submission to the things that we're supposed to have dominion over. We're not supposed to be in submission to the sun, the moon, or the stars. We're not supposed to be in submission to a dog or a cat. We are supposed to have dominion over these things. And so God used Genesis to show him, to show us one, he is sovereign and he created all things. The only thing we need to worship is him. We must know who God is and his nature in order to move into the promises of God for our lives. We must know who God is as sovereign, it's the sovereign as the father, sovereign as the son, sovereign as the Holy Spirit, so that we can enter into the promises of God. In, Gen in, in Genesis, when we talk about Moses and we talk about the people of God, they weren't able to move into the promised land because they never got it together here that God was sovereign to what? To Baal, to whatever else they were worshiping in the desert. They were busy worshiping a calf instead of worshiping God. What are we worshiping instead of worshiping God today? Are we worshiping our social media platform instead of worshiping God today? The things that should be in submission to us, we are in submission to it. Some of us are relying on our gifts because, and this is where I struggled with this, but I'm gonna share it, hallelujah. 
because we refuse to put away false idols. Even with everything that we see going on around us, we're, we're looking at the news, Mr. Chenna touched on it a little bit earlier. We're looking at the news, we're seeing everything going on in the world. Signs of the times are everywhere. And yet we refuse to put away false idols instead of relying and focusing on the sovereignty, which is our God. God says in Isaiah 42 and verse eight, uh, reading from the King James Version, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So he's not sharing his glory with anything, anyone, nothing. And so when we sit here and we refuse to let go of these false idols and we're relying on our gifts because our gifts are given without repentance, we are not on the path to heaven because you cannot enter heaven attached to a false idol because God's glory will not be shared with another. You cannot enter into heaven with your heart still connected to your Facebook likes. Because God's glory will not be shared with another. And so God, uh, whew, the Holy Spirit said hell is widening its mouth for gifted people. I know in the church, church, folks, we don't like to talk about hell, especially in American church. We, we shy away from that topic. I have See, been to many churches. I've seen many churches. They don't like talking about hell. We talk about everything else. We sing Kumbaya, Hallelujah. We don't talk about hell because folks, especially in America, don't like to hear about hell and judgment. But there is a generation that is rising that isn't afraid to hear or to speak because they don't plan on being there. They have a hunger and a thirst after God, and they are not afraid. This is a generation that sees the signs of the times and are looking for a church that's going to prepare them for an eternity in heaven. What are you preparing for? A church that is unafraid to spread the complete undiluted gospel. And so I can't be afraid. Hell is real, y'all. If you believe that heaven is real, if you believe that God is real, then it it must, it must lead you to the fact that hell is also real. And trust me, I had to come into that understanding. So I, I understand where, you're, where you are. I had to come into that understanding. I had to look at it and say, well, if I believe God is real, if I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead, then hell has to be real. And it, it, it posits that I have to get myself in order I have to see God, understand God, and know who he is so that I can make my way to be with him into eternity. There is no religion on the planet, and I'm going to go back to sovereignty. There is no religion on the planet that doesn't teach us that there are painful consequences for our actions. And so why should the church be silent when we know the truth? Now, I'm going back to Jen. I said I wasn't going to stay there. Genesis lays down the initial revelation of God's sovereignty. He is the Lord of the universe who will move heaven and earth to bring about his plan. He desires to bless people, but he will not tolerate rebellion and unbelief. His promises are great and he is fully able to bring them into fruition. To participate in his plans has always required faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's Hebrews 11 and verse six. Moses, I'm going to use him as an example. His lack of faith prevented him from entering into the promised land, right? But that didn't mean that God's plans were thwarted. What? He used Joshua instead. God's commands are an exercise of his sovereignty, and as his people, it is our responsibility to obey God's plans. When we don't obey God's plans, it doesn't mean that his plans stop. Because God is sovereignty, therefore his will is sovereign. And so when we choose, because we also have free will, when we choose to not follow his sovereign will, then his sovereign will skips us and moves to the next. 
And so we want to talk a little bit about providence as well, because we talked about sovereignty, and now we're going to talk about providence, which is what? The exercise of his sovereignty, right? Uh, providence is a manifestation of divine care or direction. I like prudent management of resources, right? But it's not just uh, us as a resource, it's everything as a resource. He used the earth, he used the sun, he used the moon, he used the stars. It's management of resources. And yes, God will use wind. Come on, we, we read the Bible. We know that when Elijah was was into the um, went into the cave, the wind came and blew, and God wasn't. Like, God will use whatever He needs to use to get His will done in the earth. So we say, simply put, it's God's exercising His divine will. That's that's providence. Most of you will see, as we talked about earlier, that sovereignty and providence are used interjectionally. They're used uh, combined because one does not operate without the other. God is in control. Even when it doesn't feel good, his plans work for our good. His plans are a prudent management of resources. And so sometimes when he is prudently managing us, we don't want to be prudently managed. And so we say it doesn't feel good. I see Minister Chen said he will use a donkey. Amen. It doesn't always feel good. But God is wise. And so sometimes when we can't understand how God does, why he does, the way he does, the time he does, God is doing it because he understands the best way to get to his will being accomplished. And his will is always for our good. I'm going to use myself as an example. Many of you know, three years ago, God interrupted my life and said it was time to go back to school. Now, when he first said it, I was shocked. I was uncomfortable. Uh, I was comfortable, excuse me. I had a career. I was doing well. I was traveling. Uh, my timeline in my head was great. I was like, I'm going to do this, this, this. I had my life planned from beginning to the end. Hallelujah. Uh, I was uh, pretty much about to be ordained as a pastor at the time. So I knew that my life was already starting to shift. And here God is telling me to go back to school. And I'm like, God, but wait a minute now. I said yes to the pastorship. I ain't say yes to you doing all of this now. And so God is like, time to go back to school. And I knew that it was God speaking because at first I got multiple confirmations. I got, And on top of that, I was also feeling it internally. I was starting to feel... Uh, uncomfortable on my job. I was starting to get a little bit anxious and irritated because of the position that I was in and the length of time that I was there. And I was already praying about that. And so I knew that it was God speaking to me, but at the same time, I was like, really, Lord, I've been out of school for X amount of years. I'm really not trying to be back in school. I was, I had made up in my mind, I wasn't going back to school, to be fair. And so I had to readjust my thinking and say yes again to the Lord to going back to school. One Sunday, PR said, do it afraid. I said, all right, Jesus, fine. <laughs> and I totally did it afraid, y'all. Every step of the way, I did it afraid. I was like, that, that being afraid did not leave me even after I've started school. And I did uh, begin school that same, that following semester after the Lord gave me that word. I studied, I took my entrance exam, I applied to colleges. Every step of the way, God moved on my behalf. Every step of the way. He, the, he made sure that I was able to pay for, to take the exam. He made sure I was able to study for the exam. He made sure I was able to buy all the books to study for the exam. A lot of people took, and I'm just, I'm not bragging on me, I'm bragging on God. A lot of people needed to get tutoring. I remember going into the test, a lot of people did tutoring and had people come and teach them and take classes to take this test because the test was so difficult. All I had was me and some books, things. And I took the test and I passed the test with a score good enough to get me in to university. While I was waiting for my results and waiting to see if I got in, 
I was still trying to figure out school, I'm figure out work because I was like, I'm still working. Maybe I can go part time. Maybe I can do this. I was trying to work it out. And then right before I got the answer from the school, my supervisor calls me and says, well, Deandra, well, we have to restructure you right out of the company. I said, what you mean? <laughs> yeah, we got to restructure you out of the company. And, you know, we're going in different directions and, you know, all the, all the fun stuff they like to say. I said, okay, fine. I said, all right, Jesus, have your weight. Cause Lord knows I was still trying to hold on to this job while going back to school. My last day on the job was Friday. School started the Monday morning. Tell me that's not God. Tell me that's not God. God don't play. When God is exercising his divine, what, prudent care and management of resources, everything falls into alignment. Everything. And so we see God move. I saw God move in this manner. I'm going to tell you one more part and then I'm going to continue. So I started the first semester, right? And I'm thinking, I was like, God, I don't know how the kids are going to get to get to uh, the kids, the kid, because it was only one at the time. I don't know how my son was going to get picked up from school. God worked it out. Right. Folks, folks who didn't think that they were going to thought that they were going to be working, ended up not being able to work. <laughs> and God was able to use them to pick up my son from school. They, I mean, God was working it out for them as well. But it worked out for me as well. Also, I'm not going to sit here and say God kept them out of job just for me. I know that but it worked in my favor. And so the semester ended, the person was, was getting a job and I was like, oh Lord, how, what am I gonna do now? We're going into a new semester. How is this gonna work out? And so God worked it out. God shifted everything. And then what happened? Pandemic hits. And then what happened? The rest of my classes are online. So I'm able to finish school and not worry about my son for the rest of the semester. Saints of God, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, when we step back and allow God to move, when we yield to the Holy Spirit, we see God move in a prudently managing his resources. It didn't always feel good. I didn't always know what God was doing. I did a lot of it afraid. God was exercising his will in my affairs for my good. And not just for my good, for my child's good. Because he was blessed as well. God exercised his will for Joseph. I'm using another example, a biblical example. Joseph loved his brothers. And I put in here, even though he was a snitch. Joseph was a snitch, y'all. He was a little cocky, <laughs> but he loved them right? Genesis 37. If you don't believe me, go read it. He was, he was, he was a man, he was management, but he was, yeah. Uh, his brothers betrayed him. They sold him into slavery, but God used it for his good. Could it have gone another way? Absolutely. But man also has his own will, right? Joseph's brothers had their will too. And so in their will, they decided because they had heard the dream. And so they heard the dream from Joseph and they knew that they knew that Joseph was blessed by God because how they reacted to that dream lets you know that they knew that Joseph's dreams usually manifested. I'm gonna believe that that wasn't his first dream. And so for them to react the way that they reacted lets you know that they knew that God was speaking through Joseph. And they chose and decided to sell Joseph into slavery because they did not want that dream to manifest. Read your Bible, that's what it says. And so, yes, man's will is still existing in the earth. God does not supersede man's will, in a sense, right? But, God, but what? His divine providence is still sovereign to man's. And so even though they sold him into slavery, God still used it and worked it out, not just for Joseph's good, he worked it out for the brother's good. He worked it out for the entire nation of Israel's good. 
And so even as they were being messy, God still blessed them by saving them. Saints, nothing catches God by surprise. And I'm only briefly going to talk about this. Even in the present crisis in Russia and Ukraine, does not catch God by surprise. If you're worried, if you're stressed, if you're concerned about what you see going on on the news, I know I have been watching, I've been paying attention. None of this catches God by surprise. And we know this because, and I, we know this because Revelations 13 verses one through two is being fulfilled. If you read it and you get that revelation from it, you'll see it for yourself. I'm not going to go too much into it, but Revelation 13, verse 1 to 2 is being fulfilled. God's, the time of man is coming to an end in this, in this period, in this era is coming to an end. Jesus is coming back soon. And so a lot of you, I've, I've, I've talked to people on the street. I've talked to other people. Know you know, if you're watching this right now, if you're watching this read broadcast, you know, you see the signs of the times God is calling you because the same way he called me back into his loving arms, he is calling you and beckoning you to come back, to come back to him, to give your life over to him. And if you decide, if you feel that beckoning, and if you want to answer, we're going to pray this prayer of salvation right now. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray this prayer of salvation with you today. Before we do that, I want to explain to you what scripture verse is the salvation prayer. It's Romans 10 and verse 9. King James Version reads that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so this prayer today is that confession. If you want to pray this prayer with me and believe in your heart that Jesus, that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and that he rose again from the dead. Lord, come into my heart. Come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Take complete control of my life and help me to walk in your footsteps daily in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for answering my prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed this prayer and believed it in your heart today, then you are saved. The heavens rejoice and we rejoice with you. The next step is to get connected to your local church or reach out to us because we would love to hear from you. We love to pray with you and we love to connect with you. I just want everyone to know that joined us this morning that's watching this on repeat, that we love you, we're praying for you, and we hope that you have a blessed and amazing week. And we wanna thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us here at Going Places with Jesus Ministries. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Hallelujah.